Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about world affairs and the people who shape it. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch, and in this show we discuss topical global issues and have in-depth conversations with personalities in foreign policy. Global Dispatches is presented in partnership with Humanity in Action, an international educational organization, and I am a Humanity in Action senior fellow. So it sort of goes without saying that we are in a period of profound domestic turmoil here in the United States. I clearly don't need to run down the list of everything out of the ordinary that is happening in D.C. You know full well what is happening right now is just not normal. But I am curious to learn how some of America's long-standing allies in Europe are interpreting this unique moment of U.S. history. And I was also curious to learn how diplomacy with the United States has changed over the last year and a half since Trump took office. So I could not think of anyone better to whom I should put some of these questions than Klaus Scherioth. He is a veteran German diplomat, having served in the foreign ministries since the 1970s. He was the German ambassador to the United States from 2006 to 2011, so spanning both the Bush and Obama administrations. He is now a professor of practice at Fletcher School at Tufts University, and the ambassador is also a member of the board of directors of Humanity in Action Germany. We kick off with a conversation about the ways in which the day-to-day practice of diplomacy with the United States has changed since Trump took office. We then have a wider conversation about the evolving nature of transatlantic relations and how the fundamental worldview of Europe is clashing with that of the Trump administration. I recorded this conversation a couple of days ago, and one thing that has stuck with me about our discussion was the ambassador's emphasis that America's capacity for self-correction is among its most widely admired attributes in Europe. The implication here, of course, is that the outcome of the Mueller investigation will, of course, have profound diplomatic consequences and long-term consequences for the image of the United States abroad. A couple of things before we start. If you are listening contemporaneously and you are at UMass Boston, I very much look forward to seeing you next week. I'm giving a a talk there. Also, for you premium subscribers, I've just posted a bonus episode about the implications of the Trump administration having nominated for a top spot at a key UN agency someone who has said disparaging things about Muslims. That bonus episode and others are available to those who support the show via the Patreon platform. And if you support the show via Patreon, I will also, as a reward, add you to my Dawn's Digest Global News Clips service subscriber list. This is a a morning news clips service I put together, send out to subscribers, mostly people who work in the development and humanitarian uh, fields, um, who are professionally engaged in those fields. But it's basically a a roundup of the top news from uh, around the world that is relevant to the global humanitarian community and, frankly, global news junkies uh, worldwide. And there's a link to the Patreon platform where you can become a premium subscriber in the description field of the podcast episode. And of course, you can always go to globaldispatchespodcast.com. All right. Now, here is my conversation with Ambassador Klaus Scherioth. The practice uh, on the lower levels, to my knowledge, hasn't changed that much. There's, of course, much exchange among the professionals. I think what Europeans have to get used to and what what is difficult for them to understand is that this uh, administration, and I believe it's the first one in the last 60 years, which seems not to be convinced of the value of multilateral approaches. And you see, for instance, for Germany, this is one of the lessons we learned that if you want to be effective, you have to act multilaterally. Mm -hmm. And so this is true in climate. You know, if you want to do a climate deal, you have to do it with everybody. But it's true for all major policy aspects. And I feel that this current administration is less committed to that and that they have 
the idea that some things could be done bilaterally, and I disagree there. That's my one point. My second point is I also believe that some in the administrations have not yet realized that to be successful in negotiations, you need to create a situation in which you have win-win. Mm -hmm. That means uh, a positive outcome for all sides concerned. And I think there is, there are some who believe in zero-sum uh, thinking, that you either lose or you win. If something is good for Germany, it must be bad for the United States. The opposite is true. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to always find uh, solutions uh, which are true, f which are good for all sides. Otherwise. Yeah. Any agreement doesn't last. So uh, I would think now with the incoming new national security advisor, John Bolton, that the sort of non-zero sum uh, approach to the world that is favored by uh, Europeans might might be an even deeper retreat. Uh, that, you know, we're going to see this kind of zero sum outlook on steroids over the next uh, coming months. Uh, how, I mean, have European diplomats adapted to that thus far? I think, uh, you see, uh, we mostly disagree. We just try to convince our American friends that there is great value in win-win and that zero sum does not work. You see, of course, uh, this administration is not alone in trying to do zero sum. Uh, I would argue that, for instance, also Vladimir Putin did zero sum when he invaded Ukraine, uh, Ukraine the, the Crimea, in uh, 2014, and did this in violation of international law. That was purely zero sum uh, game. But I, you see, I really believe, and I'm very convinced of that, that in the longer run, only win-win survives. Only win-win solutions uh, are can be kept up and they can work in the longer run. Well, well, can I ask, I mean, how different is this from, say, the Bush administration when you were uh, the ambassador to the United States? The Bush administration also, uh, you know, had a more zero-sum view of the world and, and also often favored bilateral engagement over multilateral platforms. Much less so. I think you have a point there, much, much less so. You see, for instance, uh, when we talked, let's say, about NATO, uh, I'm not aware of anyone in the Bush administration who ever called into question that NATO was a good thing for America and, by the way, also a good thing for Europe. And uh, so and NATO, of course, is a multilateral organization. And I also am not aware that they really, let's say, attack the European Union as something not being good. I, I, I really see a difference here. And I, I think that uh, the, uh, the turning away from multilateral approaches is really striking because I'm not aware of any U.S. administration in the last, uh, yeah, I would say, 70 years that uh, followed a similar approach. I'm wondering if you can share any anecdotes uh, from your conversations with other uh, European diplomats that help illustrate the kind of uniqueness of the moment we are in right now. No, just uh, look at the uh, utterances about the so-called JCPOA mm -hmm. to, to make it understandable for everyone, the Iran nuclear deal. You see, I'm like practically all my European colleagues, I don't know any exception, I'm, I'm very convinced that this is a good deal. It is. It prevented uh, Iran from acquiring nuclear, nuclear weapons. And it was, in my view, a huge success. And I think this view is shared by all colleagues. Uh, I, I don't know a single one who had a different view in Europe. But now I feel that you have people here 
in the administration who don't share that view. And I'm not sure that they are always aware of the consequences. If you would, uh, let's say, uh, leave the deal, if you, if the United States would uh, do that, I think it would not only be a great mistake, but I think it would have really bad consequences for the Mideast. I also um, want to put a question to you. So in a previous episode, in a previous conversation I had with a national security reporter about uh, the JCPOA and, and the potential for the Trump administration to uh, renege on it, he, he had like a really interesting term that he used. He said that this decision by the United States to pull out of the JCPOA cannot be cauterized from the rest of American diplomacy. That is, the United States can't just take this decision and if, and expect it um, not to influence every other aspect of Americans' relations with the rest of the world and with Europe in particular. And I suppose I, I, would, I would put that question to you. Okay. So like, how would that manifest itself? Say, you know, in mid-May, say the United States, uh, you know, as probably expected, pulls out of the JCPOA. Uh, how would that affect other aspects of European engagement with the United States of, of you know, transatlantic I mean, relations. let, me, let yeah. me begin with a slightly different aspect. I think it would jeopardize any uh, possible solution with North Korea because, you see, how can you convince the North Koreans to enter into an agreement with the United States uh, when the United States just days before has left a similar agreement with some other country without any convincing reason or let's say any obvious breach uh, by the Iranian side. But I think, as you say, it would also have an effect on on Europe. You see, there have been very good, very, really very truly good uh, conversations among uh, the, the parties of the of the JCPOA, the seven, that means uh, Germany, Britain, France, the EU, Russia, China, and the United States, very good talks. They were very constructive and all gave in a little bit and all, uh, you see, were sure that we would have one common view of the seven. And I don't see that currently. Uh, in the uh, the current U.S. administration, I don't think that they uh, would necessarily uh, find a solution which is acceptable to all seven. So, so and so I'm concerned. Well, well, so so let me ask: like, what would what do you do with those concerns? So I ask because it seems that the decision-making process of this administration is unique from the, say, foreign policy decision-making process of other administrations. And, you know, over the years, European diplomats like yourself have learned where the appropriate pressure points are, where, you know, you might be able to influence a policy decision in a way that you think is favorable to Germany, but perhaps ultimately, you know, a win-win situation. Uh, but this administration uh, seems somewhat shut out from those kind of conventional uh, decision-making processes. So, like, how are your former colleagues adapting? You see, I very much agree with your assessment, although, of course, I have never negotiated with any person of this current administration. Mm -hmm. I have to say that yeah. because... You're not in real all, estate. You know, yeah, no, so, I'm yeah. not in real estate, yeah. so I have nothing to do with those. And yeah. I, therefore, I can only share your assessment by what I hear from colleagues and what I hear from uh, people who are still in office. And what I hear is that it is in, 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 in reality, like you said, it seems to be quite unique. The decision-making process, which has been always very organized inside the White House, and I had the big fortune to know quite a few of the national security advisors and, so, and had to deal with them, and I, so I was fully aware of how decisions used to be made in the White House. And I'm not so sure that this is still the case. Of course, I can't speak uh, from my own. I just can't, can speak from what I hear. But what I hear seems to be very different. 
And therefore, I think, you see, we will, of course, Europeans will try to talk all the people in the administration they believe uh, would be able and would, would be ready to listen to us Europeans. And I think there are some. For instance, to just give you an example, I have a very high opinion of your Secretary of Defense. I believe that he is very careful in his decision making. And I think it is worthwhile talking to him and he might be uh, talking to the big boss. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's the, that's basically the entry point at this, at this moment. For instance, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, there were also, for instance, very good talks with H.R. Uh, McMaster, mm -hmm. but he's no longer there. And you see, I can't really say how talks with the president are because I never talked to him, so I have no idea. But what I read uh, in the press uh, seems to be very different from previous presidents. And I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you look at someone like Jared Kushner, who um, you know seems to have gotten along well with the Emiratis. And so there's like, uh, you know, there, there's like, you see the Emiratis, for example, um, wielding a great deal of influence to to their advantage in in Washington, but uh, not say like the because much of this administration is not from traditional foreign policy circles, the traditional foreign policy allies are not wielding kind of that same degree of, of, of um, influence. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm very skeptical of people who have not really great experience in foreign policy. One should be very careful to believe that you have done uh, most of your life, let's say, whatever real estate or other business, that you immediately are an export or expert on foreign policy and on Mideast. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you this is all very complicated and every, everything is connected to everything. And so I think people are well advised to have people around who know a little bit about the history of that region, about the politics, about who hates whom, who likes whom, what are the histories behind that, what are the power plays of the future of the of the past. And I'm afraid that allowing people who have not had this experience to uh, play a major role, in my view, is a mistake. Um, so I wanted to ask you a bit based on your experience uh, as U.S. ambassador as as U.S. ambassador in 2006, I believe. So uh, 2006 to 2011. So so this is actually a, a good moment for me to ask you about how the relationship between the United States and, and Europe uh, recovered, it seemed, after a huge break early in the Bush administration. Right. Um, you, know, I, you know, I remember reading articles about how the transatlantic relation is doomed, and there were like, you know, hundreds of pages of magazine articles burned on, 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 on those specific questions, um, because it really was a, a, at a low point. But we seem to be at a, another low point right now. And I, I wanted to ask you, like, how did it recover, or, and did it fully recover? Oh, it did. You Fully. see, you are absolutely right that mm -hmm. we were at a low point. Let's be very open here. It was about the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. We totally disagreed. Uh, we in Germany believed it's a huge mistake to do that. And I myself uh, went over here to the United States to convince the U.S. administration that this would be a mistake. Uh, but I was not convincing enough, so it did not work. And the U.S. administration, as you know, for very different reasons, uh, thought that intervention in Iraq was right. So this was a huge problem. And I think we had a very difficult time, especially during the first Bush administration. I would not say that this was equally true for all members of the Bush team. Mm -hmm. We always had... Uh, a very good and close working relationship with Colin Powell at the State Department that throughout those difficult years was always good. It was more complicated with the uh, with the Pentagon, mm -hmm. and but I think with Colin Powell we had very very good uh, interaction, and I must say that 
the Bush administration then in their second term, they really tried to, uh, yeah, to make it work again. And they really reached out. You see it, you can, uh, you see just a few examples. We, for instance, in the beginning until basically end of May 2005, the U.S. was very skeptical about our talks with Iran about the Arvin nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. And only in May 2005, they changed their view. But they did change it because they began to understand our rationale behind it. And actually, in 2006, they even became more active. So I would say, starting with the second term of uh, President Bush, it started to improve all the time. And I can give you, you see, we had opinion polls in in the embassy or by, made by the embassy, and they really showed that the curve was going up all the time. And then under Obama, I think it reached really almost unprecedented closeness in our relationship. And, and you know, it was sort of that, that shock of, of Obama being, you know, the first African-American president, you know, sort of, you know, sort of reestablishing kind of liberal, the liberal credentials of the United States that um, I think reasserted American soft power in a way. I mean, you know, he won the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, his first year in office, like that, that sort of thing. But I'm, I'm wondering... Now that we've sort of reverted, regressed in in a way, if sort of America's image uh, in the eyes of, of Europeans can ever kind of fully recover after having uh, elected Donald Trump. You see, you're right that you see Obama was more popular, for instance, in Germany than in the United States. Yeah. Yet uh, ratings of higher than 80%. Here in the States, he was had something like 56 or 57 at the end. He was highly popular. And you see, we very much agreed with his policies, for instance, with New START, this reduction of uh, nuclear missiles with Russia, uh, on many, many issues. We were really seeing eye to eye. And this was not only a delight to work with the Obama administration, it also had repercussions for the image of the United States. There was a huge respect in, the, in, in Germany and I think in many European countries that the United States had come so far to elect, to elect a black president, an Afro-American uh, president. That is, if you look at the history of the United States, quite a feat. And there were many, many people, I think, around the world impressed with this uh yeah with this reversal of previous i mean jim crown all of that mm -hmm. i don't have to yeah. tell you what it is you know we are aware of the history and we thought that you see uh the martin luther king and the civil rights movement and what lyndon johnson did for that mm -hmm. it came to a very good high I don't know if that's English, yeah. <laughs> culmination with Obama. So he was not only popular, but I think he enhanced the image of the United States more than you here in the United States think. You see, I always find here people who don't see that aspect, that this seemed to prove the point that you not only talk about what I call the, the, the values of the Enlightenment, that is tolerance mm -hmm. and uh, religious freedom sure. and minority protection, freedom of the press and free elections and free judiciary, independent judiciary, rule of yeah. all of that. You, you also did it. Yeah, but, you and, elected a didn't. person who was uh, very different. And I was, I was really delighted. I had tears in my eyes when... I uh, got the results in November 2008. So, so I mean, but now we've uh, elected a racial demagogue with authoritarian tendencies. So, you know, and that hurts the image. You see, I cannot. But is, is it recoverable? You, it, it, you know, is 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 the brand recoverable in the eyes of the German? It depends on how long how long you have that. I would say, I'm. You see, if you let's say, uh, if this lasts eight uh, to eight years. I have my doubts. Uh, I think, you see, I'm always a big 
fan of the American capability to self-correct. I think this is one of the greatest strengths of the United States. You are better in that than we in Europe. We didn't get rid of Hitler alone. And you see, there were many countries in Europe who didn't learn from their mistakes as much as the United States did. And I think the United States really had this amazing capability to self-correct. And so I very much hope that also in this situation, the United States herself will correct the situation. Can, can I ask maybe one final line of, of questioning, uh, which goes back to something you started off with, which is sort of U.S. disengaging from multilateral institutions and, and from a multilateral approach in general. Uh, is Europe prepared to um, pick up where the United States left off? Can Europe be a substitute for U.S. global leadership uh, that it had typically, a uh, kind of glo global leadership that it had embraced, you know, across both parties uh, until this administration? will be difficult. And you see, uh, Europe alone makes up for about 7.5% of the world population. Together with America, we are about 12.5%. Um, I think for Europe alone, it will be very, very difficult. And you see, uh, I think all of the current world order is basically based on U.S. ideas, the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, the International Court of Justice, NATO, all practically all uh, GUT, which later became the WTO, all basically U.S. ideas and U.S. Uh, projects. And I think uh, the United States has really, in a remarkable way, uh, created this rule-based system, what we currently have. And this was not only interest of the United States, of course it was also in the interest of the United States, but I think the United States was in those 70 years a benevolent world leader because the United States plays, a states played win-win. You know, what was good for the United States turned out to be good also for Europe. And I'm not sure that Europe can immediately um, take up that role. I think even in the long run, it would be difficult for those 7.5% of the world population to do that. But then, of course, also, you see, we within Europe have to agree among 28 countries. That's a complicated process. It usually takes time. It's then a very good thing. But you see, here in the United States, you have just one country, and so you can act quicker. And I think you see, we would only we would have to acquire this tradition which you have had in the last seventy years. So I don't think it's impossible, but I think it will take a long time. And I would very much prefer to have this old, very close transatlantic alliance between North America and Europe. Lastly, you know, we, it seems, uh, are entering a period of really tremendous domestic political turmoil and upheaval here in the United States. And I know that you have been uh, a German ambassador, German diplomat for years, probably, I presume, even in the Watergate era. Your, your, uh, uh, I was here in the States. I was here studying at the Fletcher School, but oh. I was not yet in government service. But okay. I was here. Well, I, I I was here when the Saturday massacre happened. Huh. Well, I'm wondering how that kind of momentous upheaval informs other countries' relations with the United States, or might inform how how a diplomat under undertakes his job or her job. Yeah, you see, that's what I mean with uh, capability to self correct. You see, as as horrible this was, Saturday massacre and whatever, we in Europe were impressed that the United States corrected herself, that the United States found a way to, uh, yeah, to convince the president that he should step down, and by a complicated procedure. But anyhow, mm -hmm. it it worked, you know, and I think other countries 
have not been successful in doing that. And I, I was very much impressed with how the United States at that time solved uh, this crisis. You see, I'm especially impressed with the free media here in the United States. I think they are just amazing because I have really never felt that any American journalist was intimidated. And that, I think, is what a free press is all about. And I feel the same way about the courts. And therefore, I have this belief that America will self-correct. But I could foresee that if some decisions are made the wrong way, that you could enter into a deep constitutional crisis again. Yeah, I, I can foresee that as well, unfortunately. Um, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, well, Ambassador, thank you. This was very helpful. It was, it was uh, refreshing to sort of get an, an external perspective on, on the craziness that, that's happening now, but also, more importantly, <laughs> understand it's, it's broader, but it does have like real-world you know, implications for, for America's relationship with the world. So thank you. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to the ambassador. That was great. And, and thank you to the ambassador for being so involved with humanity in action as well. As always, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions or comments or suggestions of people I should interview or topics I should cover. I also still have a few stickers left. If you want to leave a review on iTunes and send me an email, uh, I will gladly mail you uh, one of these stickers. All right. Thanks all. We'll see you next time. Bye. The views and opinions expressed in the podcast are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policies or positions of Humanity in Action.